Hello, my name is Stephen Bedard and I thought I would take a little bit of time just to share about how I became a Christian. Now there's different kinds of testimonies out there. There are those who were raised in the church and, and that's my testimony. There's also those who went through a time of philosophical reflection. Well, that's my testimony. There are those who have gone through bad life choices and had to discover that there is a, a better way out there and, and discovered God in the midst of those circumstances. That's my testimony. And of course there are those who have incredible spiritual experiences where they just experience God in an amazing way. Well, that's my testimony. I'm going to share all of that in the next few minutes as I talk a little bit about my background. Now I grew up in the church. I attended an Anglican church and I was very much involved. Now I wouldn't say I was involved because I was particularly religious. I just felt I should help this uh, relatively small church in whatever ways I could. I had the time so I did that and also it was an opportunity for me to be around other people my age and so that's really why I did it. But I was, I was pretty involved, uh, more than the average I would say. At one point, though, I was involved in a service, and I was what's uh, called a chalice bearer. Now, a chalice bearer is someone during the Eucharist who shares the chalice with the wine to the people who are receiving the Eucharist. And I was doing that, and the one morning, as I was passing the cup and said, the blood of Christ, which was shed for you, I realized I didn't really believe that. It just didn't mean anything to me. I didn't believe anything about Jesus other than the fact that he existed. That was it. And so I began to think about what I was doing if I was really being honest with myself by being so involved in church. So I quickly uh, got out of the uh, responsibilities that I had. And then I got this great idea that I was going to take some time and study all of the religions and to discover which one was true. Now that sounds like a, a great idea, but I never did do it. I, I got lazy and it just didn't happen. What I did do is stop attending church. I thought I just need a break from this and I needed some time to figure things out. Well, it wasn't long after that that I actually discovered that I was an atheist. Now, some atheists will say to me, you're not really an atheist. Well, I didn't believe in God and I don't know any other definition for atheism than not believing in God. So I wasn't an agnostic. Uh, I didn't think that there might be a God or, or not. Uh, I just did not believe that there was a God. So I was an atheist and I was self-described in that way. So I went through a period of time like that and that went on for a while and then I was in university. and something happened. I still really remember the experience of it. I was uh, on my way to class and I began to think about creation. I thought about a whole bunch of different things. Now I wasn't using philosophical terms. I wasn't thinking about the cosmological argument or the teleological argument. All I was thinking was there is a universe and I just could not see how that could happen without someone causing it. That's, it was pretty simple in my reflection, but that's the conclusion I came to. And I also remember just looking at nature around me, looking at the uh, Niagara Escarpment where uh, Brock University is, the university I was attending, and looking at the, the trees and the grass and the flowers and everything else and thinking, I just don't see how this came about by accident, especially the human body. I would look at my my hand and my arm and like how does this work just by an accident how did chemicals just randomly come together and out of that come us and so i just realized at that point i didn't have enough faith to be an atheist because really to be an atheist to believe that all of this uh, the universe and life that all of it came about by accident requires a tremendous amount of faith and I just did not have enough faith to believe that. But that didn't make me a Christian. That made me a theist. I went from being an atheist to a theist. I believed that there was a God but it was just a generic God, some kind of creator God. In fact, 
I really wasn't thinking that Christianity uh, would be the likely answer to which was the true religion. Basically, I thought that because it was just too obvious. I was born in Canada, and the predominant religion in Canada happened to be Christianity, and that's why I was brought up as a Christian. But I thought if I was born in Saudi Arabia or Nepal, the results would have been a lot different. So I thought Christianity is, is pretty unlikely. But I did want to find out what the real religion is. And so I went through a, a time of, of reflection on that. And uh, one of the things that happened was I prayed. Because as I was trying to figure out what was the, the true religion, I thought, there's only one person that I know who really knows what the true religion is, and that's God. He's God to know. So I prayed to God and said, God, show me what the true religion is. Now, i got to confess, there was a little bit of a P.S. at the end of that prayer. And uh, that P.S. was, dear Lord, don't let it be Jehovah's Witnesses. I was really afraid that Jehovah's Witnesses could be the true religion, and I didn't want to go door to door. And so I asked God that that not be the true religion. Uh, I don't think that he actually took that into account. But anyways, it wasn't long after that I found myself working for some Christians, some uh, evangelical, charismatic Christians who had a totally different way of looking at faith and at Jesus than I had ever thought of before. And so they began to witness to me. So I, I was working for them. Uh, they were my managers. And so every once in a while, they would stop me and tell me to stop working, and they would begin to witness to me, which is fine. If they want to witness to me, uh, I'm getting paid for it. And that's no problem at all. And they would hand me a chick track, if you know what chick tracks are. And uh, they would uh, get me to read that on company time, and I would read that and get paid for it. And I would never show them what was happening. But I was beginning to think that maybe that there was something here. And so... Uh, one of the things I began to do is to read the Bible. I'd never actually read the Bible before. In fact, I never thought that anyone read the Bible. I thought the Bible was for people to read in church. I never thought you could actually read it outside of church, that you would just sit on a chair at home and read the Bible. So I began to, to read it. So some changes were happening there. I was beginning to think, you know, maybe there's something to this uh, Jesus thing. But to be honest, at this point, I had uh, quite the lifestyle going on in terms of drinking. I was a very heavy drinker. I was getting drunk uh, multiple nights per week, and uh, that was what my life was. I just lived to drink, and uh, I was known as the the one among my friends who would be able to, to drink the most amount of alcohol, and I just didn't want to give that up, and so I was really hesitant to accept Christianity because I knew that there would have to be a change in my lifestyle. But over time, I was beginning to see that maybe uh, I needed to make some changes based on what I saw in the Bible. Well, it ended up that uh, while I was still in university, that uh, a friend of mine had suggested that we go away to Mexico. And it would be a time just to celebrate after exams. And so uh, we decided to go. And I still remember in the car on the way to the airport, uh, saying to my friend, and uh, I said to him, you know, I've been reading the Bible, and I think that uh, I shouldn't get drunk anymore. I, uh, I will drink a few drinks, but I won't get drunk, because that's what the Bible says, and, and I need to do that. And my friend, who had known me for many, many years, said, yeah, right, I don't believe that one. Anyways, that was my intention. And then we got on the plane, and wouldn't you know it, they had free alcohol on the plane. Now, how do I say no to free stuff? Well, uh, it's it's hard for me. That's my personality. So I, I drank on the plane, but I kept it pretty careful. I made sure not to get drunk. I was very careful in how much I drank. So I felt like I was doing pretty good. I was off to a good start in my mind. I really wasn't at a good start, but in my mind at the time, I thought I was. So we got to the hotel. And when we got there, we thought, well, we're here for two weeks. We really don't need to go out and party. We can just, uh, you know, have a few drinks in the hotel bar, and we have uh, two weeks to enjoy. So anyways, we went and sat down at the bar, and unfortunately, I mixed in a horrible way. I still remember what I drank. I had a tequila sunrise, a Long Island iced tea, 
and a kamikaze. And it just was a bad combination. Uh, I was used to just drinking beer, so for me to drink all that stuff, it just did a number on me. Ended up that we went out to another bar, despite what we had said, and I started drinking beer. Well, then I was really out of it. This was just bad. Now, normally when I had been drinking, I just got kind of sleepy, but now with all these different kinds of alcohol, I was just weird. And so while we're at this bar, a uh, number of things happened. One is I got my wallet stolen, which wasn't very good because I had uh, about $150 US in my wallet, had my all my ID in my wallet, and that was gone. And then I got uh, kicked out of the bar, and I don't really remember why. I have some ideas, but I was pretty out of it, and so I got kicked out of the bar, but by myself. My friend was still there. He didn't know what had happened, and so there I was in the streets of Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Well, that's not very good, and I was wandering around trying to figure out a way that I could uh, just sleep this off and then get back to the hotel in the morning. Well, I saw a uh, little old lady walking down the street, and I saw what door she went into, so I ran after her, banged on the door and said, uh, let me in, I gotta stay here tonight. And for some reason, she didn't open the door. I, I don't know why, but she didn't open the door. So uh, I sat down on the curb feeling sorry for myself and wouldn't you know it, the police came. Uh, she had uh, called for a ride for me and they had a place for me to stay, which was called jail. And I'd never experienced anything like that before, and I was put into jail uh, with about uh, 20 other guys, and I was the, the only tourist there. Uh, the rest were all locals, and uh, there I was. And I was instantly sober as soon as I went into that jail. And uh, so I made it through the night, and in the morning, I asked the guard, how do I get out? And uh, he simply went like this. I needed to pay a fine, which was 50,000 pesos, which really uh, was only $15. But the problem is, if you remember, my wallet was stolen, so I had no money on me. So I said to him, let me call my friend at the hotel. He can bring some money, and you, he can pay my way out. What the guard said to me was, no, no phone calls. You pay or you don't get out. Well, I was just freaking at this time. What am I going to do? I had heard stories of things that happened in Mexican jails. I didn't want to be another one of those news stories. I didn't know what to do. And so I, I looked up in complete desperation, and I saw Jesus. That's right. I saw a painting of Jesus on the wall. Yeah, Mexico is a very Catholic country, and so there's pictures of Jesus everywhere. And I saw that picture. And it made me remember a passage in the Gospel of John talking about praying in Jesus' name. And I thought, I got no, nothing else that I can rely on here. I, I know I messed up, but there's no other options for me. And so I prayed silently, of course, uh, a very simple prayer. And it was literally, dear God, get me out of jail in Jesus' name. And remember, that was silent. Not long after that, like within a number of minutes, one of the other guys in the cell came up to me and said, I'll pay your way out. You can pay me back at your hotel. And I wasn't sure if he was just pulling my chain or not. So they, he went out and uh, and not long afterwards, the guards came and brought me out and, and uh, we went by cab to the hotel. And the one thing I had on me was my uh, card key to get into the safety deposit box. I still had some a traveler's checks there and I was able to to pay him back and to pay him a little bit over he didn't ask for anything other than what he had paid but I, I gave him some extra so he wasn't trying to cheat me or anything like that uh, God just provided the the right opportunity at the right time now, I got to share one other story about Mexico so I'm coming back from Mexico to Toronto and I have no idea on me and you really need some identification if you're coming back from Mexico. They, they don't like you to come back without identification. And so as we got to the airport, uh, I could hear the guy at customs say, uh, birth certificate, birth certificate, birth certificate, asking everyone in line for the birth certificate. Now I'm just, I can feel the sweat going down my face, knowing that I don't have that birth certificate and not knowing what he's going to say. My friend went through birth certificate. He showed the birth birth certificate. 
he came to me and all he said to me was, are you with that guy? And we had the same kind of party hat and party shorts and all that kind of stuff. And I said, yeah. He said, okay, go ahead. He never asked me for a birth birth certificate. But everyone else afterward, I could hear him, birth certificate, birth certificate. He asked everyone else. I was the only one on the plane he didn't ask for a birth certificate. And yet I was the only one who didn't have one. So that really shook me that God was real. Now, that shared uh, that shook me in two ways. One was the, the reality of God, that he existed, but also the grace of God, because I really messed up. I knew that I wasn't supposed to get drunk, and yet I did. It was deliberate disobedience, and yet God, in his grace, reached down in that Mexican jail cell and brought me out of there. And so that completely changed me. Now, I still wasn't a Christian. They were still a part of me that was just afraid to let go. Well, one of the things that was happening as I was uh, back safe and sound in Canada, uh, in the evenings I would just watch TV just because that's what I did. I, every night I would watch TV. And I was flipping through the channels and came across a Billy Graham crusade. And uh, I had, you know, knew about televangelists. I was of the age to watch the downfalls of uh, Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart and all of them. So I just assumed that Billy Graham was like all of them. So I thought, I'm going to sit here and count up all the times he asked for money. And it just so happened that the uh, crusade that I watched, he didn't ask for money at all. And I couldn't believe it. Blew my mind that he wasn't asking for money. And the other thing I noticed was, I really liked his preaching. It just made sense. He was very clear. And so uh, not long after, there's another Billy Graham crusade on TV and it just seemed like they were on all the time right then and so I was watching them regularly however there was one problem that I had with Billy Graham crusades and that was the altar call I didn't have a theological problem with it what the problem I had was I felt uncomfortable when it went on I felt like I felt like God was calling me to do something and I couldn't figure out why because I was doing good things I had started attending my uh, my home church again, the church I had grown up, I was uh, attending that and I was doing things that seemed churchy and uh, yet every time Billy Graham had that altar call I just felt this call upon my life. So it actually got to the point where I'd watch Billy Graham crusades because I enjoyed his preaching but I would shut the TV off before the altar call because I didn't like how I felt. And then finally I realized, wait a minute, all the excuses that I had really didn't mean anything anymore because by that time uh, thanks to my Mexico experience I had given up on uh, drinking uh, excessively and uh, I just I wasn't abusing alcohol at all anymore and I had no intention of ever getting drunk again in fact I had uh, given it all up as a New Year's resolution before this uh, ever took place so I thought, what, what am I waiting for? What is there that I need to hold on to? And so I realized it was time for me just to, to let go. And so I contacted the Billy Graham Evangelical Association, and they sent me some information, and I prayed to accept Christ. Now, I'm not saying that the uh, sinner's prayer is the only way that you, became, that you become a Christian, but it was convenient for me to have that moment of sacrifice, of uh, surrendering to God and that's what I needed. Now all kinds of stuff have happened since then. I ended up uh, attending uh, after that a uh, another church and I was baptized as a believer and I uh, went on to uh, to go to seminary and become a pastor and all kinds of other things but that's a story for another video. But here I just wanted to share this about uh, what had happened to me and I hope that you find it useful and uh, if you're interested in things of faith, I'd encourage you to check out my website, uh, stephenjbedard.com.